Hello and welcome everyone to the latest City University of London uh, European Social Survey and NAPSTEN Survey Methods webinar. Uh, I'm Tim Hansen, a Senior Research Fellow at ESS Headquarters in London and I'll be chairing today's session. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome Florian Kusch, who will be our speaker today. Uh, Florian is a Professor of Social Data Science and Methodology in the Department of Sociology at the University of Mannheim and Adjunct Research Professor in the Joint Programme in Survey Methodology at the University of Maryland. In his research, he assesses the quality of modern methods of collecting data for the behavioural and social sciences, with a particular interest in self-reports and passive measurement. Uh, and today, Florian will be presenting on the topic of data collection with wearables, apps and sensors, providing an overview of the currently available technologies and how they can be implemented in surveys. Uh, he'll talk for about 45 minutes and there'll be some time for questions after that. Um, if you do have any questions, please type these in the Q&A area and we'll go through as many as we can. So I'll now hand over to Florian. Thank you, Tim, for the nice introduction and thanks for having me here and, and allowing me to speak about a topic I'm very passionate about. I have, I've done uh, some research on this over the past couple of years and I'm happy to share what we have learned so far, kind of like where we are at the moment and where we think uh, there is more research needed and, and potentially also um, how this can be implemented in uh, the type of data collection you all might be using. So what I've planned for today is talk a little bit about, I'll give a little bit of an, an, an intro that is more kind of like trying to sell the idea of, of using wearables apps and sensors um, to you, like why you should at least consider using them as an additional tool for uh, uh, data collection. Um, then I'll move into talking a little bit about, or the, the, it's actually where the meat of the presentation is gonna be talking about what we can actually measure. Um, this will be a little bit of a an, an overview of the technology, but also kind of like the, what potential substantive research questions are that you might be using. And of course, I mean, I'm trained as a server methodologist, so I'll, I'll balance my kind of like sales pitch from the beginning very much at the end with uh, concerns or challenges that we see when we implement uh, this type of data collection and, and where we um, also uh, think that you should be careful or should think about when you uh, collect this type of data. Before I get started, I want to really acknowledge that this is work I have been doing over the past couple of years with uh, a number of wonderful colleagues from all over the place. Um, here's uh, the, the the names of the main collaborators I have. So a lot of the ideas that went into this webinar stem from collaborations, uh, joint teaching, and and, and joint uh, writing uh, with these people. So I'm very thankful for that. Okay, without much further ado, I want to start out and say like why might you consider using wearables apps and sensors for data collection in your in your own work right so why might be this be helpful so first of all um i think this is maybe not uh, shocking news to you but uh, the uh, our our uh, how people interact uh, digitally has dramatically changed and um we could with these wearables apps and sensors, we could take advantage of technology that's already wi widely used in, in society. Mainly, if we think about smartphones, they have a large penetration. Um, of course, we know there's certain groups in the population that don't have smartphones. I'll come back to this. But overall, this is probably the tool, uh, the device that um, most people are using, right? Um, both as a telephone, but also getting access to the internet. There's this whole quantified self movement. So beyond smartphones, people are using now smart trackers. Uh, this might be smart meters in their home, might be wearable devices that they wear on their wrist or in other places. And the advantage of all this is that the devices are present in the same physical and social context as the user. Um, that allows us really also to move from what used to be small scale lab studies to really large scale field studies because the technology is already distributed. The, uh, this technology uh, allows us to collect data in multiple forms, multiple new forms potentially from, potentially even a single device. This could be some type of an in-situ measurement in the moment, the uh, 
idea of an ecological momentary assessment or experience sampling method, EMA, ESM, you might have heard this, this term is, is not brand new, right? People were given pagers in the past and, and ping to report something in a paper diary. Now we have smartphones where you can ping people and they can report how they feel in the moment directly on the smartphone. On top of that, you can do passive measurement with sensors, automatically collecting information that happens on the device, but also about the surroundings of the user and the device. You might use other device features for active uh, measurement. I'm thinking about photos, video, scanning. And you might use smartphones then also as a hub for other devices, such as smartwatch, a smart scale, Bluetooth connection to other types of devices. And again, this might depend on what exact type of measurement you're interested in. This type of measurement might can be much more frequent uh, and produce and, and in come, the data might, can come in, in much higher intensity than what we used to have in traditional surveys, which provides potentially much more detailed information about users and, and people. Um, this, there's this term intensive longitudinal measurement that comes from EMAs, but on top of the self-report, again, you have passive measurement that could, in theory at least, continuously run in the background, which allows us much more finer grained data than in traditional longitudinal designs and new types of information that can cannot be self-reported, right? Think about the things such as different stages of sleep, for example. This measurement um, now when, when it comes in, in a passive way might is potentially much more unobtrusive, but then also more direct um, of certain behaviors, especially. Um, the these behaviors uh, then uh, th these measurements uh, need less self-reporting, uh, that means less recall error, less potentially less social desirability, less data entry error. So we see a data quality component here as well. Uh, this all ties together then with potentially less respondent burden because we have to ask fewer uh, survey questions or we wouldn't even be able to ask all these things in survey questions. I cannot every two minutes ask you, where are you right now? What are you doing right now? Where are you right now? What are you doing, right? So, uh, but with this type of, technology, um, we might actually get this data without increasing the burden too much. However, I already want to put a caveat on this and, and come back to this later. Maybe there's other burden that comes with this type of data collection. It might be consent, compliance, privacy issues, uh, concerns about technology in general. Um, and I mentioned this already when I when I said this is technology that's widely used uh, in, in, the, uh, in society. Really, this is data collection at scale. And there is a number of large scale studies now out there that are already doing this. Um, it starts with um, studies that um, let people download an app uh, and basically crowdsource certain types of information. Think about the UK Biobank as another example where people are um, given wrist accelerators to wear and they, they built up a, a data bank of more than 100 thousand participants. In the US, there is the big all of us study where the goal is to have uh, eventually 1 million people providing data, for example, through self-reports, but also through um, Fitbit uh, data collection, right? So these are numbers that we just weren't able to collect this type of data because we had to bring people into a lab um, to go through a study protocol, um, which is um, an, an unnatural, like a lab um, uh, a setting where the data might have much less external validity. Now we can really outsource this at scale with um, um, at, at, at relatively low costs. And then finally, um, I put this here with a question mark. Potentially, we could even dare asking new research questions. And this is something me and my colleagues have are, are have been discussing a lot. Is it really that we can now um, ask new research questions, or is it that we are just now better equipped to ask research questions that we already had, but and now we have better data for that. I think it's both uh, in a sense. Um, and I, I would dare to ask, to, to consider really thinking a little bit outside of the box. I think we were to a certain degree limited by the methods that we have been using in the past. Um, in, in the past in terms of um, uh, survey data collection um, that happened just in, in certain uh, uh, frequencies uh, longitudinally, right? Like every every year or every ha um, um, half year or so with self-reports. Now we ha can have 
things uh, measured at much finer grained level and potentially then also ask research questions that are really tailored towards this new type of data collection. But this is something I really um, am curious to hear from everybody. Also, um, people who do much more substantive research, right? I, I consider myself really a methodologist thinking about the the, the methods behind this, but I'm, I'm always amazed when uh, working with people uh, in specific fields of, of how they come up with new questions that were to say like, oh, we, we haven't even dared to uh, ask these type of questions because we didn't have the tools for that. So as I said, this was kind of like my intro, right? I, I hope some of the things are at least convincing to at least start thinking about using wearables, apps, and sensors in data collection. Um, let's dive a little bit deeper into what is even out there. Um, and first of all, we have to think about, well, there's different devices, right? Different tools that people have. And I, this is a completely incomplete, more not random, but but very selective list of potential tools that I, I want to briefly talk about, and, but give you the, the understanding that we have to think about tools and technology and then um, what we can do with these different tools, right? On the one hand, of course, there is the smartphone, which is, uh, in my work at least, uh, one of the primary tools that we use because it really encompasses so many uh, different things. It allows self-report. Um, it allows a certain measurement in the background about the environment where people are, uh, about physical activity, as I will um, show in a second. Um, but also it, it allows the self-report component, which makes it really a, a, an interesting tool for many, many researchers. Then we have designated fitness trackers, right? So, you know, the Fitbits and all the other brands that are out there that many people are now wearing as, almost as a lifestyle choice, right? Um, some of them are a little limited in the sense that they um, do not much but uh, collect uh, step counts. And But the, the technology is advancing and, and we see more and more that, and that's what we have here on, on the on the bottom left, that there's a emerging of kind of like, what is, is this still a watch? Is it a fitness tracker? Is it both, right? So we have this whole component of smart watches that then link back to smartphones. Um, sometimes even have some apps, some, some have even basic, response functions that might one use. What both of these devices have in common, the, the fitness, the designated fitness trackers and the smartwatches is just that they are consumer grade products, right? They're they're built and marketed for the consumer market. So uh, the that's where the users bring their own devices usually to a study, um, which is a great thing on the one hand, but it also has limitations when we want to use this for data collection. One thing is of course that we have a breadth of different products, right? Not all of them work on the on the same platform. Many of them have different platforms. Many of them um, collect data in in slightly different ways. So once you have this this a lot of different devices, it might get hard to uh, compare the data coming from them. But they're very appealing to people, right? Uh, if you think about giving this out potentially as an incentive, people like to receive a Fitbit or something like that. Then of course you have these more research grade devices here, the, the Gene Active, the Actigraph, you might be familiar with some of those um, brand names. They are really marketed to researchers, right? And, and there the, the idea is, well, they don't have an interface at all sometimes as you can see here. And then they're just handed out for uh, a research project and then sent back to the researchers because they basically track uh, information on step counts and, and other activity. But for the user themselves, they don't have a, a strong appeal. Um, so you have to, to weigh this, right? Because you have to design a protocol where people are really wearing those devices uh, and um, uh, sending them back. But uh, compliance might be an issue here, right? Because the device doesn't really do much for the, for the user. I also have here two other sets of devices. One is here, different GPS trackers that are common or that are very specialized potentially, right? Um, that might be used in, in very specific fields, just as an as a dummy here, I put this um, as, as a group of, of things that there is many other devices out there that have a very narrow um, field of application. There is a ton of um, medical or health related um, Bluetooth devices, for example, that collect um, digital health data, but have a very specific and narrow uh, uh, application. And then it, it depends really on, on the research project or the research question you have, whether this is a device that's useful. And then you have all these, what's now called environmental sensors that come in different shapes and forms that are can be placed um, in, in locations. And sometimes they're uh, placed in the 
public space or sometimes they're placed in, in people's households to collect some type of data. So this is just, again, an, 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 an overview of potential devices and, and tools we're talking about here. As I mentioned, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about smartphones. I'll also incorporate some of the other devices, but I think the smartphone is especially interesting because, first of all, it has a number of native uh, smartphone sensors built in there. Um, so maybe you knew that potentially your smartphone has all these, and these are just kind of like the most common uh, sensors that are out there. Many of even the um, cheaper or uh, lower, less expensive smartphones now have um, a lot of these uh, sensors built in there. And the important thing is it's not about the individual sensor, but it's what groups of sensors or what the data that comes from these sensors and, 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 and the data provides in terms of context about the user. Um, of course, I'm, I'm sure people think about uh, location, um, but there's a number of sensors that provide information about physical activity, potentially for smartphones. You could think about measuring ambience or environment of people in terms of the audio or light that comes into uh, the smartphone. And then a lot of things that connect to the smartphone, but it also tells us something about, potentially about proximity to others or proximity to other places or proximity to uh, other devices and therefore other users. I'll pick up a couple of the most common ones here, and start talking about geolocation, because I think geolocation is probably the one thing that's most often used uh, in when sensing uh, together with the active, um, uh, activity data. And geolocation can come from different sources in a smartphone or any other smart device, right? That might be GPS, so the traditional um, geopositioning system that allows you um, to basically base your location based on the on, on the GPS or GNNS uh, system that works with satellites. That has a limitation if you are in a big city potentially where uh, there's high rise buildings where the satellite uh, connection is not that good, right? Um, but then there's um, other things. There's the cellular network, of course, right? So the cell towers. And, and here I, I, I use a map here of, of London of some of the cell towers. I think this is just from a specific uh, a brand of, uh, of, of a provider. Um, but basically, the cell towers, of course, also work as a geo coordinate, right? And if you're in the vicinity of at least three cell towers, the location based on triangulation is pretty precise. Um, what many people don't know is that a lot of geolocation data comes from Wi-Fi networks. Uh, a bunch of companies operate or maintain lists of uh, uh, Wi-Fi systems, networks in, um, uh, in uh, around the globe, right? So again, we have a city map here of London and all the uh, purple violet dots are uh, individual Wi-Fi networks. And those are not coffee shops or, or open Wi-Fi networks, uh, public Wi-Fi networks. Those are any Wi-Fi networks that a device might register, right? You, the device might not log into this Wi-Fi network because you potentially don't have the password of your neighbor or something, but your device will register that there is a network, right? And in the background, there is these lists that are maintained by companies like Apple, Google, uh, and the like uh, that maintain these lists. And then you can retrospectively match this information based on, uh, especially uh, based on, on, on city data where GPS sometimes is not uh, so well um, 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 reachable for, for some devices. Um, this Wi-Fi network system also works if you want to do indoor um, uh, tracing of people, right? And that's what in some shopping malls, supermarkets is used that um, through the routing of the uh, Wi-Fi networks, uh, the, the the routes that someone walks in an indoor, in a shop or uh, in, in, an, in an office uh, might be connected. What most uh, systems now do is they use a hybrid approach to use positioning system from whatever they can get in, in terms of the best quality. Well, what can you do with this type of data? Um, I really like the work that um, Aaron your Cromwell and, and Kate Cagney are doing where they um, are using smartphone data to understand the um, the what they call activity spaces of older uh, adults. So where do people spend their day? And um, there's a a number of very interesting studies where they found that um, this is data from Manhattan, New York, um, where they GPS tracked people based on their smartphones. They also did some EMAs, so asking them multiple day, times a day about their feeling and, and what they're doing right now and, and um, found clusters of people that spent their days only in their neighborhood um, and others who really commuted throughout the city 
to get access to other resources, right? So very interesting, um, interesting idea of, of better understanding how people spend their day, um, where they get resources for their everyday life and, and how they can overcome potentially uh, areas where there is low resources. I, I think this is a very, very clever um, way of, of using this information. Um, that's the second big thing is of course physical activity, which is uh, used a lot with this technology. Um, the, the the main sources here are the accelerometer and the gyroscope. The accelerometer in your smartphone or your smartwatch is that measures any direct any movement, um, any acceleration of the sensor in a three dimensional space. The gyroscope then also measures the tilting of the phone, and together with or of the device that has this built in. And together, sometimes with a compass, this allows you to really um, um, uh, track certain behavioral patterns or movement patterns, right? So if, if a phone makes a certain pattern or if a Fitbit or in this case, an Actigrave makes a certain pattern, then it can be inferred from that with a certain degree of certainty that you're using a certain point of a, a mode of transportation. This is how your iPhone or your smartphone count steps or your or step counter count steps because it, it infers that this looks like a step so I'm counting this as a step. Um, again physical activity is used in, in many different um, applications of course in in, in health uh, types of uh, research questions. We used it ourselves in a study uh, on unemployment and the effects of unemployment where we're interested in how active people are who are unemployed compared to the people who are employed and, and we equipped people with a smartphone app and, and fold them around for six months in Germany. And we knew from uh, registered data whether these people were employed or unemployed on any given day. And we looked at the uh, comparison both for uh, men and women. So the, the top row here is men, the, the bottom row is women. And then on weekdays and weekends, and you can see the, the solid lines is people we know are employed and the dashed lines are people who are unemployed at that point in time. And you can see patterns here, right? So for males on the weekend, on the weekdays, uh, not surprisingly, the day starts a little bit later if you're unemployed. and and But then they seem to be catching up a little bit in their physical activity. They never reach the full... Um, average of, of the employed one, but you can see the, the, the confidence intervals are overlapping. So we're rather certain or, or um, we wouldn't say that there's much going on um, here um, once the day has, has come to kind of like midday. It's interesting that on the weekend, however, when you um, exclude the, inf the, the information that basically uh, the working uh, men are, uh, are, are going to work or physically active at work. So um, we still see a gap, at least in the uh, um, in the morning hours until um, around the early afternoon, that unemployed men are still less active than unemployed men. And again, we can account that these people are not working here. Uh, what's also interesting is that we hardly see any of those differences for women, right? So, which is an, 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 an interesting, but not a shockingly new finding that um, a lot of women seem to be um, as active uh, regardless of whether they're employed or unemployed. Um, another group of people, and now I'm moving a little bit more to, I would say, a little bit more niche or uh, other applications that are potentially not used that often. Heart rate is something in, in health research, of course, or stress measurement used uh, quite often. So the Fitbits and, and the, the uh, other wrist-worn devices usually use an LED-based system for heart rate. So this is not the same system that your doctor uses when they, uh, when they hook you up to an EEG. Um, it's basically a delay definition would be a, a light is shining on your skin and based on the reflection. Um, and here is what, what Fitbit says and fine-tuned algorithm predicts or is applied to measure heart rate and basically on the, on the blood flow that's going through a vein here, right? Um, this comes, of course, with, with a certain degree of error. This is uh, for sure, but it, it, there are studies that show, well, this can be used at least to some degree to measure variation in um, or in heart rate or heart rate variability in these type of things. Um, heart rate is then often used in, in combination with other things such as acceleration, acceleration to also measure sleep. So for example, if you have a Fitbit, that's basically where Fitbit gets your sleep data from. Uh, on the phone, there might be other tools used, the microphone and the light sensor. Microphone, of course, 
in a survey context now with microphones, a lot of our colleagues are experimenting with having active recording. So instead of typing the responses, having people respond um, and record the audio, but you could also do some kind of like passive recording. Um, and I have to be careful not saying recording, but it's a passive measurement of ambient sound that's usually processed on the device. So in only very few cases where it's actually legally possible, um, studies do record what's happening outside. What a lot of studies are doing is they pre-process the data right on the fly. So there's an audio coming in and based on the, uh, the type of noise, based on the pitch and the like, there's a classification happening on the phone that says, well, that's potentially someone having a conversation with someone. And then what's stored and sent to the researcher is then the information. Well, at that point, someone had a conversation with a research uh, with another person or someone was out in traffic or things like that. It's not actually the content that's stored in many cases. Um, you might also use the light sensor that comes with each phone to just understand something about the brightness outside. And, and again, in combination, these things might be used to measure things such as sleep or activity state. Um, there's a nice study that's now almost 10 years um, old, but in, in, in at a university in the US, what they did is they equipped students with um, um, uh, smartphones and, and had different types of data collection. They had self-report. Um, about uh, stress uh, measures uh, and academic performance, for example. But then on the smartphone, they collected information about uh, connectivity to other people, about their physical activity and their sleep patterns based on this, well, is light coming in? Is there a sound coming in? Is the phone moving? So they developed the best sleep model based on that. And they found that this really correlates strongly with uh, depression score and academic performance. So there is some, some validity in, in these type of measures. Um, the last point I want to, uh, or uh, one of the, the, the last things I want to talk about is, is Bluetooth, because Bluetooth, in, 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 as an extension, some other uh, connectivity, such as NFC and uh, NFID, um, but Bluetooth is probably the most common uh, used is that uh, this allows, especially smartphones, to connect to other devices. I already mentioned this um, with Fitbits, but also a lot of healthcare devices. There's a huge market now in, in digital healthcare where your blood pressure um, 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 cough might be uh, connecting to your phone. I have a scale that Bluetooth connects to my phone and other types of things. So that might be something where you automatically track, um, route this data through a smartphone in your data collection. Um, there's also this idea of, of Bluetooth beacons that could be deployed by researchers. Again, this is an alternative sometimes to, to use Wi-Fi, especially when it comes to indoor uh, a tracking of people. Here you can see a picture in, in a supermarket where this is set up, where basically the Bluetooth uh, connect, um, looks where phones are around um, in in the uh, in the store in the shop in the shop. Um, so to trace people around, this has been used for measurement of exposure to outside outdoor advertising and things like that. Um, but again, Bluetooth allows to communicate also between smartphones. And here's again an example of a nice study, I think, um, in Denmark, where they equipped a thousand students, uh, incoming students at a university, freshmen, um, with smartphones, and they connected Bluetooth information of who is spending time with each other throughout the day, but then also information in the background about um, how they communicate through other means, uh, through social media, through WhatsApp and, and the like. Uh, and they found that there's different patterns, right? So the face-to-face -face information comes from the Bluetooth connection, right? So when my phone is close to your phone, then we probably have a face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but then you can see that this extends to um, other networks that comes from text messaging that come from calls and, and other things. So it's it's more of a triangulation of seeing networks here and, and uh, especially this Bluetooth connection, but also the other um, connectivity measures are um, a big deal for people who do network type of analysis in, in groups. Um, digital phenotyping is a broader uh, terminology that's sometimes used to really measure what people do with their on their smartphones, uh, smartphone phenotyping or digital phenotyping in an even broader sense, but what people do um, online. Um, and the idea is really that 
any smartphone collects this inf information in the log files. So this is, if you think about it from a survey perspective, this is almost paradata, right? Like what am I doing on my smartphone when I interact with my smartphone? So incoming, outgoing phone calls, text messages, what apps are used, um, what internet browsing behavior is done, um, is the, are the, the settings of the phone changed? Um, this depends really on uh, the type of phone that what type of measurement is allowed and how deeply this measurement can be. We, as a rule of thumb, um, Android allows a little bit more measurement than the iOS system from Apple. So this is why you see in many studies, people limit uh, to Android um, phone users. Um, again, what can be done with this is an example from a colleague in Switzerland um, who uses uh, a, a large German data set large, um, it's relative 700 and around 750 um, people in Germany who had an app downloaded that um, um, reported this log file information of what people were doing on their smartphone. And then they um, also um, um, all filled out a big five structure inventory about personality. And they were able in their research to really predict personality or at least some of the personality dimensions based on six different classes of behavior. You can see these classes here, what apps are used, what communication and social interaction is happening. How is the day and night rhythm of people based on the phone, the overall phone activity, uh, mobility. So there's some information also coming from um, uh, geopositioning here, but then also whether people are listening to music on, on their phone and this type of thing. So very interesting, again, application of trying to measure something that is usually measured uh, in self-report through a behavior on using the small. Of course, I mentioned the smartphone also has a, a, a camera feature that allows us to take pictures of food, receipts, potentially the physical surrounding of people. More and more studies are looking into, can we substitute uh, diary studies of what people eat, for example, or what people consume and buy by letting people scan instead of having them type this out. Um, into uh, a diary. This, of course, expands to video. This is, um, at this point, I feel more used in, in qualitative type of, of research, but it is, uh, might be used more often uh, in the future. And then, of course, barcodes that could also be scanned. Um, in, in the UK, um, Annette Eccle and, and her colleagues at Essex have done really groundbreaking work here, I think, um, looking at whether people are willing and able to scan their receipts and, and compare this to traditional diary studies, right? And they found that for certain groups of uh, spendings, this works quite well, right? So asking people to scan their receipts instead of having to type them in, in a diary. And this works even better um, if you um, combine the two. So what you can see here is the, the, the blue line is the traditional um, uh, the, the, the spending study data that you get in the category of clothes and, and footwear. Um, the red one is the app uh, data that is uh, scanned and plus direct entry. So people have the chance to add more. And the green one is just the, the scanned data. And, and the lines, they're not perfect, but they pretty much are close to each other. So with a little bit of push, you might get people even more to do this. But then there's, of course, other types of um, activities or spendings that are not as well suited, right? And this is socializing hobbies, right? Where potentially sometimes you don't get a receipt even, right? If you go play mini golf or something or go to the movies, potentially you might not even have a receipt, right? And we can see, again, this depends very much on, on, on what type of information you want to collect. But again, and we're doing currently something uh, in the EU context where we try to help the official statistics offices in, in multiple European countries to move uh, data collection for uh, expenditure studies to a smartphone that allows scanning of, of uh, receipts. And then, of course, um, I want to uh, really, really emphasize that I, I, I strongly, strongly believe that most of these uh, new forms of data collection are not a substitute for old type of self-reports. Some of them might be better measurements, but in many cases, we'll still need some type of self-report um, you know, to validate what we found from the uh, passive measurement or the scanning or and or to add more information or certain information that is just not possible. And of course you could think, and this is why it's grayed out here, traditional diary studies on smartphones, they are done now, right? This shouldn't be too much of a big news here, but I really see um, over the past two years or so that uh, the uh, 
uh, ecological monetary assessment and experience sampling methods are exploding again. And again, is because this is not a new method. This has been around for a couple of decades now. But now, if this is done on an app and with a smartphone, you can collect data several times a day over several days of the week, potentially, um, in, in fine-grained self-reports, right? And so this pops up a message and it's like, okay, here's two questions. How do you feel right now? Where are you right now? Right, so very, very um, short, uh, uh, um, um, uh, very little respondents' burden, very short bursts of, of questions. The idea is here really that the immediate reporting increases ecological validity, so much better than having to retrospectively report these type of things. And and the the pinging of the participants really gets people in that context, in that that environment where they are right now. And that pinging might be uh, to report some objective status. What are you doing right now? We might get your geolocation, so we know where are you now, but why are you there and what are you doing? And a lot of subjective states, like how anxious are you right now, for example, or other um, uh, states that, that are measured. And these things can be done in a time-based manner, which is the traditional way, I would say, right? Like it could be a random selection of time points in given time windows. This is how it's usually done. The idea of an, an EMA uh, randomly sampling time points throughout the day and then get a variation of where people are and what they do and how they feel at that moment. But more and more now with this other information that comes from the smartphone or some other types of de device that might be connected to a smartphone might be that you might trigger um, information based on the geolocation where people are or based on a given event. So geolocation, that's then what's usually called geofencing, where you first draw a, a, a digital fence on a map and say like, well, if this person is in that location, we ping them, we ask them a survey question. Um, we did this in, in one of our studies here. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to share the, the, um, the references here. Or um, event-based things, right? And, and more and more of the measurement that's happening now or the collection of data about mobility and transportation is now happening with a combination of uh, passive tracing, passive measurement on geopositioning, and then a combination then adding on information on self-report. So here's a study or a, a device, um, an app from the US, from colleagues in the US, where they had trip detection, right? So the trip detection is happening automatically on the phone based on what what the phone thinks is a stop, the, the start and the end of a, a trip, and then follow-up questions that cannot be inferred from this information. So why did you stop here? What's the reason? Were you alone? Were someone else there? Um, our colleagues at Utrecht University in the Netherlands and CBS have done uh, quite some work there. So I, I invite you to look into uh, what they're doing here. Well, and then of course, let me wrap this up by uh, talking about challenges, right? Of course, I now really praised all this new technology and, and all the new things. Of course, there's downsides to this. So I really want to emphasize this and I want to oversell these things. What are potential challenges? One is of course coverage, right? I mentioned with smartphones, yes, we're getting to, in, in many Western uh, countries, I would say we're getting and, and and also other countries, uh, Southeast Asian countries, for example, getting to a really high penetration rate. And these rates might be uh, different in the global south, um, but even there, um, we're actually jumping in, in many regions of the world over traditional um, computer and, and laptop internet, and, and now people are moving to smartphones. So we'll see what in a couple of years we'll get there. But there is still differences. We've done some research uh, on our own in, in, in Germany. We still see sharp drop-offs. This is what you see on the left-hand side here is by age, right? Once, you, once we, we, we reach 55, 60, we're almost at, at, at half um, uh, penetration only, right? On top of that, we see that not only younger, but also in Germany, people who are male, who have a higher education, who live in certain areas are more likely to have a uh, have a smartphone. Some of these um, social demographic differences also kind of like uh, show show up in other uh, type of differences that are more behavioral or or attitudinal. But what we also found is, at least for the German market, that uh, the Android market is, is, is a relatively good representation of the German population, but it's very different with iPhones. So um, iPhones are just a, a more expensive uh, device usually, so you get a different group of people, you get younger people, but you get also people who have a different type of lifestyle or, or, or um, different types of attitudes. 
if we talk about wearables, um, fitness trackers, smartwatches, we're not there yet. And I'm not sure if we ever get there in terms of penetration. Um, here's, I love Pew Research. Um, they, they do such great stuff um, in, in terms of have it help us better understand how technology, for example, is is used in 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 a society. So this is U.S. data here, where they estimated for uh, uh, 2019 that at 21 percent of Americans uh, have used or use a smartwatch or a fitness tracker. But then we also see uh, quite stark differences. Women are more likely to have a smartphone, a, a smart tracker. Um, younger people are much more likely. Um, College educated people, high income. Um, households are more, more likely to have people with uh, these trackers in there. And I'm sure this extends to people who have a more healthy uh, lifestyle because they use these smartphone, uh, smart devices usually to track themselves. So this makes it, um, makes it a concern if we just let people bring their own devices. So the alternative is, is provide devices, right? So to increase coverage, to make uh, measurement more comparable, I already mentioned people have different devices, they measure things in a little bit of different ways. So this also helps here um, to have one specific configured um, device. Um, and some of the devices might even be better for measurement when it comes to uh, uh, research grade devices. On the other hand, of course, if you hand out devices, there's always the concern about uh, compliance. Uh, the costs are a factor that is not negligible. Um, thinking about, well, do you have people return the device after they're used and they have to be cleaned, they have to be sent out. This even might uh, now create health concerns. Since COVID, my understanding is that many studies have shied away from handing out devices and collecting them again. Uh, and potentially this also might create uh, reactivity point I will come back to later because if you hand people a device and tell them how much they walk, maybe they, they, they start walking more because they feel that they're not walking enough. Um, other potential um, challenges, of course, non-participation. This might not come again as a shock to you. This has to do with the willingness of people, the ability to use these devices, and then the adherence to study protocols, right? Um, me and colleagues and, and a number of other people have done some work on trying to understand what drives people or what are factors that influence participation or willingness to, to participate in the studies. And some of these things are very similar to what we know from, from traditional survey methodological research, right? That incentives help. Um, but um, since this is uh, potentially sensitive data, we also learned that agency, giving people agency, giving people more control over what data is collected over uh, at what point in time also helps increase willingness to participate. We see that similar to what we know from, from surveys that sponsors, the sponsor who conducts a research makes a difference, right? We found that the university, lucky me, um, creates uh, more trust in, in, in people to collect data than a market research company, for example. Um, we see that people who are have higher skills, who are more active smartphone users, for example, are also the ones that are more likely to download a research app. People who have already prior experience. And we see something that connects from the coverage issue where we already see that younger people are more likely to have these devices. Younger people are also more likely to um, participate and we have the same with education here. So we know that this is a concern and we have to think about this or you have to think about this when you do your own study. And then compliance also has to do, of course, with whether people are wearing the devices in the way that you want them to wear them. If you think about loner devices, if it is a clunky device, if it's not a nice, cool device, right, people might not be really um, happy to wear them, right? So it's not only the consent rate, but also the compliance rate. And this is sometimes really hard to measure. I, I won't go in, into much detail, but what a number of studies found is that um, this has to do with whether the device is visually appealing, whether it's comfortable, whether it some some things some people can just not wear uh, certain devices because they get a rash from it. Um, the battery might run out, and and things like that 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 we have to to consider. Uh, Participation or willingness to participate is always tied to privacy and ethics, right? So we have to think about that just for some people, this is too intimidating or too sensitive to say, well, I'm and I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. Quite the contrary, I'm, I'm happy that people are concerned about what data we use and, and how we uh, collect data. 
and a lot of people express strong concerns about potential risk related to sensor data, right? They don't know what the data is used for. Uh, they, they might not understand exactly what we um, what data is even collected in a study. And we see that uh, throughout many studies that people who have higher privacy concerns, higher security concerns about data collection are the ones who are less likely to participate, right? And um, so a, a, a huge burden here falls on uh, collecting consent, right? Um, of course, from an ethical and, and legal reason, we have to ask for consent. I, I don't want to question this here, but it's something you really have to think through with this type of um, data collections. What does even informed consent mean for a longitudinal data collection where people are um, giving consent to provide their GPS data every 15 or 20 minutes? If you do this for a day, you might learn something about one day. If you do this for six months, you are, I'm pretty sure you learn exactly where people live, how they spend their day, where they work, potentially where their kids go to school because every morning they stop at that same point and every afternoon they pick them up again there. So there's a lot of uh, things that are different from what we know from, uh, uh, from, from traditional self-reported data. This of course bleeds into a legal discussion, right? About personal identifiable information, what even is personal identifiable information, GDPR uh, concerns and the like. Here, the point is really, if you do this, start start now, start yesterday thinking about these things and, and bring in the legal and ethical experts in your institution to work with you on the protocol. On the other hand, there is also technical implementations, uh, privacy by design, that might really depend on the device, the operating system, and the researcher choice. So you do not have to collect GPS data for six months um, every 10 minutes. Maybe that's not even necessary for your research question. So you should really think about also data sparsity in the sense of like, well, if you don't need that data, please don't collect them. The last point I want to make here, and this is where I want to wrap up, is, is measurement, right? And and. Um, I see a lot of people getting into this field and um, I was, I think, guilty as charged when, when I started out doing this, that there's this tempting assumption that by removing most of the human cognition and social interaction that we know from surveys, that whole process of asking survey questions and people having social desirability and responding, that this passive measurements of sensor data or app data collection eliminates all measurement error, right? We are, we're going to have perfect measurement. But error creeps in in many, many stages here. And I want to give you a couple of examples of, of what I mean by that, both from the data collection, the processing, and the interpretation side. So first of all, not every sensor is the same. Not every device is the same. So every sensor is a little different. Um, and in the end, you might have different devices. I mentioned this already in your population, in your target sample, um, and, and people then get different readings based on the device they are having, right? This is just a, to depict this, uh, a, a couple of people, uh, Jan Karim Höhne and, and Stefan Schlosser did this uh, in, in Germany uh, on the university campus. They let people walk around with the same uh, tool, more or less, with the smartphone, but they then depended their, uh, the data they collected either on just GPS, a GPS and Wi-Fi combination, or um, they built an additional tool that also used the accelerometer. And you can see that the tracing of the, the routes that people go are very different, right? So be clear of what is it that you want to collect. Do you need the exact trace of, of a path that someone moves from A to B, right? That needs potentially a different uh, sensor than if you just want to measure throughout the day a, a couple of times where people spend their day. Um, measurement error might come in through the way people handle their devices, right? So, I mean, this funny looking picture here on the right, colleagues in the uh, computer science department have put different devices on different parts of the body of people and let them walk around and found that you get relatively different readings depending on where the device is actually on the body, even the same device. Um, we did our own uh, study where we asked people how they even carry around their smartphone and maybe not surprising, for example, men are more likely to wear their smartphone in their pant pockets, women are more likely to carry it in the purse. And that has an impact on how well the device picks up um, certain behaviors, certain edit, um, certain measurements of physical activity, right? And, and we found that people do all kinds of, of things with their smartphones that might inhibit precise measurement. 
there is much more missing data. It's going to be much more missing data than you would hope for. Um, in our studies, we found for geolocation uh, tracking over six months, for example, um, we only had 50% of the data points realized that we originally had planned for different different reasons. So this is what it shows here. This picture should, ha should have been completely blue, right? But there is white areas where we just don't have data. And that has technical issues might be the reason. I talked about someone might be in an urban canyon, so no GPS is coming through. The device is out of power or is in a sleep mode. The operating system is blocking you. And it might have to do with non-compliance. We already mentioned that, that someone leaves the device at home, puts it, uh, turns it off or something like that. So all these things lead to much more measurement, um, missing uh, measurement than we would hope for. However, I wanna say still, there is a lot of data that you get there, right? So um, you just have to be aware that it's not gonna be perfect. Providing feedback and 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 measurement. I put this little uh, GIF or GIF, however you wanna pronounce this here, uh, just as an illustration, but um, once people know that you're tracking them, they might change their behavior. They might put your, their phone into a, a little device that increases their step count. I think this is more the idea of cheating a, an insurance company or something, uh, but who knows? Maybe once someone knows that they're being tracked or maybe if they see that they're being tracked by watching a Fitbit that they haven't been worn before, they might change their behavior. Actually, there's, there's much more research that needs to be done. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, I would highly encourage you to, to think about that. And then um, finally is that there's errors that come through um, during processing and interpretation. This is my last slide. So we have time for some questions um, that you always have to be aware that there's some raw sensor data coming in and usually already on a device, being it a smartphone, a fitness tracker, you name it. It's very likely that this raw data are processed and classified in a certain way. That means um, the if you use a, 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 a device that is a consumer grade device, you are relying on Fitbit's algorithm algorithm to detect a step count or to detect where someone is sleeping. And what you usually get as a researcher then in the end is already pre-processed data. So in a lot of cases, we, we deal with a black box here approach that comes from third party algorithms that we really don't have a lot of information. And what looks like raw data to researchers is actually already heavy pre-processed, right? So be aware of that. Try to understand at least to some degree of the quality. Um, look at whether there's some kind of like a validation think about whether the way this um, uh, process data is, or the way this data is processed of how the training for an algorithm like that was done might not be done with the same people that you're interested in. If you're interested in, in older adults, it's very likely that the standard uh, training algorithm that was used to train Fitbits and other things are not perfect in picking up certain behaviors or patterns that people are doing. So in the end, again, I want to close out here by saying, well, self-report is still very important, being it for validating um, what you're measuring or being it for providing context uh, to the passive measurement. So with that, I hope I was able to give you a little bit of a, a smorgasbord of, of things that I think are interesting here. And I'm, I'm happy to move into the Q&A. And I want to uh, say really, um, if you have are interested in what I'm doing, what the what the people we're working with are doing, please contact me. We're always looking for interesting cases, collaborations. Um, I'm also working on a book that's going to be an, an open access book. There's only one chapter out there. Feel free to to get there and and give us feedback. And with that, thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Hey, thank you, Florian, for uh, a really interesting presentation. Um, and uh, we've got just under 10 minutes, I think, for questions. So I see there's a few there already. Um, so I'll, I'll ask these and you can respond kind of to each in turn. So first one from Andrea Marchese. How can we validate our sample? Usually data is provided by volunteers and therefore we cannot select a proper sample that could be considered representative. Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's is true. I didn't mention this, but... Um, I see two approaches are happening, right? So in, in, a, in a survey research world, right? I mean, we, we, we're concerned about samples. And I see that more and more of the large scale surveys are now implementing these type of uh, uh, new data collection forms in their traditional survey uh, procedures. And I think this is a great approach because again, it allows us then to understand 
the mechanisms that happen or or the, the the different stages of where we lose people right in terms of the sample because if you if you work from an existing sample right that a probability sample that you have pro potentially recruited for a large scale study you already have some information you know then who is willing to 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 participate in your added uh, wearables apps and sensor study so that might actually help you to um, at least use some weighting or at least understand who you're missing from on the other hand, of course, we see a lot of studies that where basically um, researchers take volunteers, right? And say like, okay, whoever already has a Fitbit and is willing to participate in our study, um, participate. And that's what I mean by, well, then really think about who already has a Fitbit, like who are those volunteers? And, and what are the, are you potentially concerned that those are the super healthy or the people who want to get more healthy already, right? And then you have to think about, well, is this, are you going to be able to generalize to a larger population? So very important question um, do you have to think about in these type of studies? Great, thank you. Uh, next question from uh, John Burton at uh, WTP. You, you had on one of the slides, willingness to participate. Um, can you just clarify if this was measured by looking at actual participation rates or was this a question about hypothetical willingness to various activities? Yeah, excellent question. Thanks, Jonathan. You, the, the willingness to participate um, is usually measured as a, as, a, as a hypothetical one. There is relatively few studies so far out there that really look at actual participation. There is a few out there. Most of what I'm showing on that slide is actually hypothetical willingness. Um, we were able or research was able to corroborate some of these, but again, I think we need much more studies. We need to move away from, I'm, I'm guilty as charged with having uh, done a lot of these hypothetical questions, but I think we move, need to move towards more kind of like, okay, what people say is one thing, but then whether they're participating or not is a different thing. And, and I, I think we need more research on that. So shout out to Jonathan, please do this type of studies. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, next one from Ava. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, thinking about the limitations of passive data collection and the limitations of traditional self-reported measures, um, how do you see mixed mode data collection, including surveys and passive sources? How comparable is the data after processing and harmonization, um, e.g. self-reported trip data versus GPS-based data? Yeah, no, excellent question. Um, I've been thinking about th this, this has, this is not the thing that, that keeps me up at night, but this is something that ha I have been thinking a lot about and I don't have a definitive answer to this. But I can tell you my going into this, my idea was more kind of like, okay, we will have some measures where we are sure that the self-report is still going to be better and some measures where we're sure that at the end, the, the passive measurement is better. And I think this is true for some things. But we found for other things that we're actually not measuring the same, right? So uh, sometimes the self-report is really a perception measure, right? Like of what people think they're doing. And, and that's maybe still a valuable type of information. And then you have the passive measurement that itself has measurement error, but it tells us something more directly about behavior. And I th I'm a big fan and, and Alex Chern and, and, and others have been working on models to bring together data sources uh, from different data from different sources and, and combining them and thinking about to how to integrate them, acknowledging that both of them have measurement error, right? And that potentially we need to move in a direction where we at least have an overlap of some of them to better measure actually certain behaviors and attitudes. So I think this is this is actually the direction that we need to to be going and thinking about. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Question from Miranda Phillips. Do you know of any examples of wearables or apps that have been used in research with children? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, there is few out there. There's few publications out there. I know that some people um, with, usually then the devices are very specific. So those are specific bracelets for kids, for example, or necklaces for, for kids that, that have been used. Um, usually you, depending on the age of the kid, you don't give them a smartphone, for example, right? So you give them really some type of a wearable. Um, the, 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 the additional um, concern or, 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 or layer of complication, of course, is, is, is consent and, 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 and having to work, of course, through um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the adults or parents or, or guard, legal guardians, right, to, to get consent. So there is a few studies out there. Um, 
it, I think it's an interesting field, but it it I think it adds just another layer of complexity that we already have with privacy and and concerns that people have. It's like okay, I don't want you to track my kit, right? So which is again, of course, makes sense. And and I, in general, I think we need to rethink the way we approach people about consent and 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 make it clear of what we're doing and how we collect data to 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 uh, yeah reduce the concerns that people have at this point about the, this type of data collection. Thank you. I think we just got one minute left, so I'll maybe take one last question. I know questions are still coming in, so apologies we don't get to your one. And obviously, you can go ahead and, and email Florian to. Of course, please do so. Um, and just to say, the recording and, and slides will, will be shared afterwards as well. But just one last question. Um, I was impressed how in depth you discussed the problems and issues with wearables, smartphones, etc. Um, after these considerations, what purpose do you actually suggest them using? Actual usefulness seems to me rather narrow, especially with generalization intentions to a certain population. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I'm, 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 I keep questioning myself, like, okay, now that we know all these things work only to a certain degree, um, need, do we need to be careful? Yes, we need to be careful, but I think this is not the end of it, right? And I mean, uh, you, you could argue surveys are not perfect either, right? So um, we, we know that we need to think sometimes outside of the box and need to think about new ways of collecting data. And again, I think going forward, it's going to be some kind of a combination, right? As, as, as Eva had, had, had asked, like, okay, how can we collect different types of data from people? And again, this might be a third part, might be uh, record linkage to to uh, to official records and, and things like that. So I'm thinking of that as kind of like more a, a broader thing that you need to think about what's your research question? Is there a potential application for these type of things? I, I'm, I'm certain that there is applications, um, but I'm also saying not every type of research question lends itself to use smartphone or app data. I'm, I'm far from want to be kind of like an evangelist uh, here and see like everybody has to use them because I don't think that's that's what's what, what should be done. Sure, oh, great. All right, that seems like a good point to finish on. So yeah, apologies we didn't get to your question. Um, as I said, please please do contact Florian. Um, and yeah, thanks very much Florian for a really excellent, really uh, interesting presentation that has raised lots of questions and, and interest amongst uh, the participants. So thank you everyone so. and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.